A Hermit in the Himalayas by Paul Brunton. Chapter 4. For several days now I've been making my ascent to the imposing natural amphitheater, which is my sanctuary despite the constant pains in my back. I faithfully kept my tryst with stillness. The deodar begins to unbind from its aristocratic stiffness and welcomes me as our acquaintance grows. Before long, he will admit me into the sacred circle of friendship without a doubt. The russet leaves have made a little clearing for me as though to intimate to the world that this place is specially reserved for someone who wants to be still. The few tiny-headed mountain flowers glisten in the sunlight and their yellow and heliotrope discs of petals vie with each other to dispel their faint scent and make the air sweeter. Even the finely antlered hind, which fled with extreme fright but a week ago, has now peeped at me for a full minute twitching its broad ears and moist nose before making off into the lonesome forest. Yes, I'm getting on. Nevertheless, I have made no undue effort to crush my recalcitrant thoughts at one fell swoop. I take my meditations quietly, and when I relax after them, I let the thoughts simmer down without abnormal pressure on my part. I feel that there is no need to hurry, despite the time limit set to my sojourn by the Himalayan climate itself let alone by my duties to the world. Patience is the key of joy, but haste is the key of sorrow, my leisurely Arab friends used to say rebukingly when I moved among them with all my western speed. Here, somehow, I see that they are right. I feel that there will never be any need to worry about the result of my little adventure because even if it should be a complete failure to attain my aim, there will be a higher power which has taken me into its care, and its decisions may unrebelliously be accepted. I do not want to strive for further growth in spirituality. I feel as poor, lung-racked Keats felt about his art when he said, If poetry comes not naturally, as leaves to a tree, it had better not come at all. (laughs) Today, the prelude to my meditation takes a trite theme. Trite, that is to say, for the East, but perhaps unfamiliar to the majority of Western people. The doctrine of successive re-embodiments of the soul which Pythagoras called metempsychosis, and which the Buddhists and Hindus of Asia call rebirth, is as old as the oldest prehistoric people which ever existed. Hardly an Asiatic, unless he happens to be a Mohammedan, but accepts the doctrine as a fact of nature. Such is the power of inherited belief. Hardly a Westerner, but imagines that his single earth life is the be-all and the end-all of his physical existence. Such again is the power of inherited belief. In the realm of spiritual and psychic mysteries, the Oriental people have an immense fund of knowledge which has been handed down by tradition a fund still superior to that which exists in Europe and America, partly for the simple reason that the latter continents have raised ahead in material and intellectual development and have had to disdain the less tangible things in consequence, and partly because the Eastern races are so much older in point of time. It is true that the Oriental traditions have now become 
inextricably intertwined with the parasitic creepers of superstition and fable, but the original tree is still there. Not that this knowledge was broadcast to the masses, for it was kept in the hands of the few. Even in India, despite her degeneration and abasement, spirituality still exists among more than a few, so long as a mere sense of color snobbery debars us from entertaining the thought of accepting instruction from a teacher belonging to the brown race, so long as we Western folk shall be unable to find the highest teaching. So long we Western folk shall be unable to find the highest teaching. For, as in ancient times, from the days of Buddha to those of Jesus, the best wisdom has enfleshed itself in a few oriental bodies. At first glance, the notion that he lived on earth before strikes the average Western man as ridiculous. Although the Oriental has never dreamt of disputing the correctness of his forefather's knowledge on this point. The learned Buddhist monk who instructed me in Buddhism told me once of a psychological method which had been originally taught by the Buddha himself and which had been practiced in his own monastery with definite results. By this method, it was possible to discover one's former embodiments. Part of the daily practice consisted in turning memory backwards from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, until the events of a whole year were thus recovered. Later, the preceding years were similarly brought back to memory. Little by little, finally, a marvelous power of both memorizing and visualizing was thus developed and flung back to the years of infancy. Incredible though it seemed, everything leading right back to the birth date could then be remembered. Psychologists, hypnotists, psychoanalysts have almost made a fetish nowadays of declaring that the whole of our past life lies etched in the memory of our subconscious mind. If that is true, then a mental exercise which drags out the earliest infantile events into the light of remembrance is not so far-fetched after all. The discoveries of abnormal psychology are clearing the way a little. But my Buddhist monk did not stop there. He said that the abnormally sharpened faculty of remembrance was then flung across the gate of birth in their practice, and lo, it brought the memory of quite another person of the previous existence on earth. Every detail from the former death to the former birth could be traced by continuing this queer psychological process. The monk admitted that the concentration involved was fearfully difficult and that few Buddhists were ever able to go far with the method. He had himself practiced the meditations for 20 years and could testify to their effectiveness, but the most prolonged efforts were needed to wrest these memories from reluctant nature. I have neither the desire nor the competency to dogmatize in the matter, but in the light of this explanation, one must smile satirically at the crop of queens and Cleopatras which has swiftly followed the trail of this doctrine of re-embodiment since the latter has appeared in the West. Every half-baked psychic steps in where the more experienced Oriental fears to tread. Remembering bygone existences is not so easy as that. Nature has not put a thick veil over them for nothing. Hardly anyone in the lands from which I come is likely to give the Buddhist method a trial because hardly anyone is prepared to sacrifice some hours daily for half a lifetime merely to revive dead memories. The game, quite frankly, is not worth the candle. Like nature, 
we realize that the vanished past is less worthy of our deepest efforts than the living present. It would be unprofitable to drag these pictures out of their shadowed cave. But this is not to say that such memories may not come as a gift. I have had them. Most unexpected, extraordinary, and strangely op opposite. Yet, because such memories can never provide valid proof for one another, it is futile to talk about them. In this connection, the aphorism of the almond-eyed Chinese sage may be well applied. Those who know do not speak. Those who speak do not know. I can only say that if by the grace of God and the Peninsular and Oriental Steam Navigation Company, I tread Asiatic soil today. I have also trodden it in anterior lives. My thoughts are disturbed by a strange swishing sound. Something or someone is moving up the cliff toward me. I cannot tell by the mere sound whether it is human or animal, but I remain perfectly still. Soon, a pheasant advances into my line of vision. Its body is azure blue, its tail light brown. The bird takes a single glance at me and turns affrightedly, rushing down into the valley at tremendous speed. It makes a great clucking and screams with excitement. Callers, evidently, especially the human ones, are quite rare here. Because this doctrine of re-embodiment comes generally linked up with some uncomfortable notion of fatalistic retribution. Many Western people shy at it like a frightened horse. What? They exclaim horrified. You expect us to suffer for the sins of others? How unjust. Why not? The whole question hinges on who we are. If we are nothing more than physical bodies, then the objection is perfectly fair. If we are merely flies fluttering across the planet for our brief day and gone, then the West is right. If, however, we are souls revisiting this world again and again, then the request to settle up in one earth life the sins that we have committed in another possesses a certain rough justice about it. Then the destiny which puts its imprint on our lives becomes no blind, arbitrary force. I believe, nay, I know that man's destiny is with God and not with the worms. The brain does not generate thought. The body does not generate the soul any more than the wire generates electric current. Both brain and body are only conduits carrying a finer and subtler force into this dense material world. If we are mere flesh beings and nothing more, then it would certainly be unfair to ask our atoms, slowly transformed and redistributed after death into other beings, to atone for our wrongdoings. But we are that plus something more. That something more is consciousness. Really, we are conscious minds interwoven with the bone and flesh of the body. Those minds represent the summation of our characters, tendencies, and, cap and capacities. They are the real sources of our acts because they are our real personalities, not the bodies. If we believe that they do not vary greatly from birth to birth, then it is not difficult to see that the personality which has to adjust agony given out in one embodiment by agony received in the next is suffering for its own sins and not another's. But a doctrine which declares that every action must bear its fruit and that personal embodied life must continue again, 
until the consequence is worked out is quite reasonable. It dovetails well with all the other natural laws which every scientist detects in the physical world. It certainly is more consoling than the idea that life is but a lottery, where prizes are few and pitfalls are many. There is a tide of events which flows resistlessly above our personal wealth. The higher laws put themselves into execution. We need not worry. What is unreasonable is the lamentable and listless hopeless, hopelessness into which the Indian people often fall, aided and abetted by the relaxing, enervating effect of the tropical climate. The futility of a merely physical view of things becomes more apparent when this question of life's justice or injustice is reflected on. We ignore the mental side of life as being of lesser importance when all the time in nature's eyes it is the causative side. Let me read that sentence again. We ignore the mental side of life as being of less importance when all the time in nature's eyes it is the causative side. Nature certainly seems red in the tooth and claw, as the materialists say. But nature is our mother. What mother punishes her children except educatively? Nature is as real and as living as any human mother. For this planet has a directing intelligence back of it as the slightest glance at the material plant and animal kingdoms will show. And what have we done to nature that she should wish to chastise us for other than educative purposes? And how could her scheme of education be carried out with only a single earth life? Then, what is nature's aim in the scheme? Dare I say it? Is it too far-fetched for the ears of flesh-framed minds? How can this all-too-distant goal be described in words that shall make it seem at all attainable and at all rational? Suffice to hint that nature's effort is to detach us from entrapment in the material world and to restore us to the primal places of the spirit whence we have descended, or, in biblical allegory, to admit us once again to the Garden of Eden. If we have tied ourselves to this wheel of existence which destiny turns, we may also untie ourselves. That is nature's desire and will constitute our happiness. Our worldly worries must, may drag us back to pessimism, but nature draws us to peace. We must retire from the periphery of this earthly case of ours to the center. From complete extroversion to a balanced introversion. But as long as we have not found our center, we lie ever at the mercy of coming events. Those alone dwell appraised above care and fear who dwell in the center. These words sound plat platitudinous. They are. <laughs> For since the world's earliest epochs, they have been repeated in some form or another by every great seer, every great sage, and they will be so repeated until the last day of the eon. No other explanation of nature's aim has ever endured or can ever endure so long because it is the answer which she herself gives to those who know how to query her all right. One fact is preferable to 40 hypotheses. This is nature's fact. The material frame of this universe must one day dissolve. 
and our bodies with it, and yet we shall remain. But sufficient unto the day is the writing thereof. It might do some men, including myself, good to model themselves after these skyward, soaring, rocky heights, to find their stability, their fixity, their strength. Do not these mountains rise in symbolic significance as a lesson to weak mortals? Lately, my excursions into stillness have led to a distinct sense of closer touch with my surroundings. In the poet Shelley's phrase, I feel, quote, made one with nature, end quote. When I sit on my cliff edge with untimed patience, letting the beauty and the serenity of my surroundings seep into my being, I begin to feel that I too have become a part of the quiet landscape. I am absorbing into my nature the stillness of Himalaya. My body seems to grow up out of the brown stony earth, much as some small tree might have grown up. I squat on the ground, rooted like a deodar tree before me. The life which throbs through my veins seems to be the same life which runs in the sap of the plant world around me. Even the solid mountain itself is no longer a mere mass of hard crystalline rock and thin patchy soil, but a living growth obeying dis directive laws no less than my fleshy body obeys them. And as this unifying spirit penetrates me more and more, a benign sense of well-being appears to be one result. I and all these friendly trees, this kindly earth, those white glistening peaks which rim the horizon, are bound up into one living organism, and the whole is definitely good at its heart. The universe is not dead, but alive, not maleficent, but ben benevolent, not an empty shell, but the gigantic body of a great mind. I feel sorry for those materialists who quite honestly, but upon limited data, find death to be the king of the world and that the devil, devil to dwell at the heart of things. Could they but still their overactive brains and align themselves with nature's panoramic personality, they would discover how wrong they are. Nevertheless, with the latest findings of advanced scientists, in our hands, only dullards and doctrinaires can support the theses of materialism. The mysterious manner in which this growing sense of unity commingles with the sense of utter goodness is worth noting. It arises by no effort of mine. Rather, it does come to me out of I know not where. Harmony appears gradually and flows through my whole being like music. An infinite tenderness takes possession of me, smoothing away the harsh cynicism, which a reiterated experience of human ingratitude and human treachery has driven deeply into my temperament. I feel the fundamental benignity of nature despite the apparent manifestation of ferocity. Like the sounds of every instrument in an orchestra that is in tune, all things and all people seem to drop into the sweet relationship that subsists within the great mother's own heart. I begin to perceive why my honored master makes no suggestions for a special kind of meditation and gives no mystic formula to be pondered upon and unraveled. He wishes me to make no effort to arrive at some higher position, but simply to be effortless. He does not hold up some picture of what I have to become, but merely says, be. In short, 
It is a matter of doing nothing in order to allow something to be done to me. We humans have become so self-important and so self-conceited in our eyes that it does not occur to us that the Great Mother, who bears us so patiently upon her earthly breast, feeds us with such abundant variety of foodstuffs and takes us back again when we are sufficiently tired, has a purpose of her own which she wishes to achieve in us, but if we but let her. We have set up our schemes and projects. We have decided what we want to get from life, and we are thinking, striving, struggling, and even agonizing in our efforts to obtain the satisfaction of our desires. If, however, we devoted a quarter of our time to ceasing from self-efforts and quietly letting nature's mind permeate our own, we might make a wise revision of the catalog of things we wanted, yet at the same time secure nature's cooperation in obtaining them. The world is but an enlarged hotel where we are lodged and fed by Mother Nature, pay our bill and then pass on. For nature has a will to outwork in us, and only by desisting for a time with the continuous exercise of our own wills can we acquaint ourselves with her purpose. If, however, we do this, we may learn with surprise that she also has a way of silently yet forcefully attaining this end before our eyes once we help her by such selfishness, by such selflessness, once we help her by such selflessness. And then her aims and our aims become one, interblend. Ambitions and are then transmuted into aspirations. And the things we once wanted to achieve on for our own individual benefit alone become achieved almost effortlessly through us for the benefit of others as well. To cooperate with her in this way is to give up carrying the burden of life and let her carry it for us. Everything becomes easy, even miraculous. I have seen these results before, but now in my mountain sanctuary and in closer tie with Mother, I see them with startling clarity. A poet has said that nature is the garment of God. Yes, but to me nature is indistinguishable from God. I know that when I am revering nature, I am not soliloquizing. Someone receives my reverence. If God is the grand architect, then nature is the master builder of this universe in the Freemasonic system of our world. My master explains the futility of separateness by self-effort, by an effective smile. He asks, What would you think of a man who entered the compartment of a railway carriage whilst carrying a trunk on his head and who then sat down on his seat but refused to put the trunk down on the floor, yet people refused to surrender the burdens of their existence to God, insisting on carrying themselves them themselves under the delusion that no one else can carry them, just as the man in the train was under the delusion that if it was not the train but himself who carried the trunk, so too God who supports this earth supports us and our burdens and carries all along with him. How many of our sufferings arise then from our resistance Nature places a gentle finger upon us at first, but we turn roughly away. The call to entrust our lives to a higher power comes in the softest whispers, so soft that unless we withdraw for a while and sit still, we can hardly hear it, but we stop our ears. Submission, which would bring us peace, is farthest from our thoughts. The personal self, with its elusive reality, deceives us 
and deceiving and chains us. All of which, <clears throat> excuse me, all of which is but the price we pay for our desertion of nature's way. With her harmony, without her discord and consequent suffering, I cannot adequately explain the reverence in which I hold nature. It is to me the universal temple, the universal church. I hear in, southern, in South India much ado and much agitation by the pariahs and the depressed castes because the Brahmins will not admit them to their temples. The worst forms of untouchability are rampant in the South as nowhere else in India. The old caste system was a perfectly sensible arrangement in the old days. The scholar formed the head of the social body. The warrior was its arms, the tradesman and peasant its body, the laborer its feet. We cannot all be head or all feet, but today that arrangement of castes has lost its force, has been has become disorganized and oppressive, so that there are many millions subjected to cruel and contemptuous indignities. If the Brahmins were sensible, they would turn the prohibitions of the outcast into social or hygienic ones, but not religious. We may understand and accept the refusal of a duke to sit with a dustman in a public building, but when he says that he refuses by order of God and not by that of his sense of refinement. It is time to call a halt to nonsense. Were I the leader of these unfortunate Hindu outcasts, I would say to them, cease this degrading agitation and insufferable heartburn over something which may not be worth having. Nature has given you a real temple where God is just as much present as in that old pile of greasy shrines and right ridden stones yonder. Come away into the forests and the hills, or even into a bare room, and I shall show you a God these others rarely find. Nature's voice is not to be heard within. Her beauty may be discerned without, but her beneficent Harmony lives both within and without us. If I did not feel this by present experience and know it by past experience, I would not dare to write with such optimistic words to mislead both myself and a blinded world, but because the sublimity which steals into me as I sit upon this lonely cliff in the Himalayas is a genuine heart-ravishing fact. I let my pen write them down. I have suffered too much and lived too long to wish to dally with sugary sentiments which are mere fictions. But if I die tonight, then let these words be found in my journal and published, broadcast to the whole world. Nature is your friend. Cherish her reverently in your silent moments, and she will bless you in secret. And that concludes chapter four. Well, I think that was just beautiful. And the way he writes is just beautiful. And I'd just like to say a few words about this, um, this method that he learned from this old monk of going back in time and remembering. And remembering and remembering back to a past life. Now... I have a personal notion on this because I'm a spiritual regressionist, which means I do hypnotherapy, which carries people back into their past lives. 
and into the time between lifetimes. And so I've been doing this for, for more than a decade, for, for what seems like a long, long time. And so I know that people can remember their past lives, giving, given the proper instruction, direction, and also given a sense of uh, comfort and trust and safety and calm in which to do this. So when they are guided by a competent hypnotherapist, and perhaps even on their own, but you know, I mean my experience is through hypnotherapy, they can actually remember past lives. And uh, it's a lot quicker <laughs> than his method. So um, I just throw that out there, you know. Uh, there are hypnotherapists all over the world. And, uh, yeah, if you're going to go that route, try to find someone that you really trust. Because it's a big deal. Okay, just my two cents. <laughs> Uh, so chapter 5 is the next one and it's, it's entitled Unexpected Visit by Two Yogis Pilgrims and Shrines in the Himalayas and Power Out of Stillness so I hope you're enjoying this till soon <laughs>